Well, it's not quite time to begin, but I thought I would come on just about that time, give people a chance to get settled in. To mention the fact that we are studying in a survey approach to the minor prophets. Remember, they are minor because they are shorter than what we call the major prophets. So be sure and keep that in mind as we strive to look at some ideas, major messages and points that are from these particular books. Last week, <clears throat> last week we studied Hosea, Joel, and Amos. And we noticed in that study that the common message of these books is, uh, was the unfaithfulness of the people of Israel at the time these prophets, Hosea, Joel, and Amos, worked as well as their need to repent and then their need to restore uh, themselves to faithful service to God. I think that it's good that we keep in mind that these books in the Old Testament are good to know just what happened then, why they happened in their setting, but above all, we need to make application to spiritual Israel as they were made to fleshly Israel under the situation of that time. Tonight, we want to study Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah as a preliminary to getting to the survey of those books, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. It is the case that sometimes, because the Old Testament centers around uh, the Israelites, the Hebrew nation, we make the mistake of thinking that God dealt with and possibly we think this desired to save only the jews until he established his church but i think we need to understand that salvation was available to non-jews during the old testament era although when you read romans chapter one and other places in the new testament you see that over a period of time, the majority of those who were Gentiles, non-Jews, desired not to retain God in their knowledge, and they live mostly like we think of the Roman Empire and the Greeks and others living. But there were those who didn't. Paul tells the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, just what kind of a sad condition they were in at the time the gospel of Christ came to them. In fact, he even mentions their relationship to the law of Moses. It must be kept in mind that as you study the Bible, you're noticing the unfolding in history of God's way of saving man or his scheme of redemption. And that involves zeroing in on Israel and a particular tribe in Israel, Judah, and a particular family, the family of David, because according to the flesh from them did Messiah, Jesus Christ, come. And because we notice that and our emphasis is on Jesus, then we fail to realize what about all these other people who did not have the covenant relationship that the Jews did? Let me remind you again, Deuteronomy Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 through 5, makes it clear that God gave his law, we think of as the law of Moses, to the Israelite nation. Didn't mean that a Gentile couldn't decide to take it upon himself to keep the law. Thus, this is where we have the proselyte entered into us. But what about all those others? if they desired to serve God? How did they approach God not being Jews or not being proselytes? Well, it's because they didn't understand that the rest of the world could still approach God by living under the patriarchal age. The patriarchal age only ended for the Jews when the law was given to them 
As I said, Moses makes it clear. It's given to us, not to our fathers, but to us. They're all uh, us alive here this day. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5. So we must understand that Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 12, and like verses, should not be misinterpreted to mean that God turned his back on the majority of the world's population at that time. He loved them too. And that must be kept in mind. We should never get it in our heads that God only loved the Jewish people. That's just not the case. The Bible nowhere teaches it in any form or fashion. But in bringing salvation to the whole human race, God did choose one nation to keep his name alive among all nations. And of course, you know the history. Even they didn't live up to it. God, through his great providence, caused a remnant of them to stay faithful under the law to God so that Christ, according to the flesh, could come at the proper time. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It's interesting to note that even Israel misunderstood her own mission in the world. Uh, sometimes we don't think about it, but it was by God's favor or his grace that those people, the Hebrews, starting with the Messianic family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then developing into the Messianic nation, the nation of Israel down in captivity in Egypt, then finally being brought through wilderness wandering and in that wandering a purification process so that when they entered the land of Canaan, they were very faithful to God. Now, it's important to realize, though, that they let this being a chosen people of God not cause them to be humble and meek and lowly, and to keep his commandments at all costs, and to realize they were to keep his life, his nation, his name alive among the nations of the world. But they became smug and self-righteous, and they were a great um, people for bigotry. So instead of serving and enlightening the nations around itself, as Israel became cold and aloof, misunderstanding why they existed, why God called them to exist. And not only that, they gave up the law to follow after the wicked nations round about them. That's most of the history of the Old Testament regarding Israel. Now, all of that must be kept in mind as we approach these three books in our study of the minor prophets, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. So let's move on and look at the background to the books of, or rather, to Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. First of all, we'll look at Obadiah. He was a prophet of Judah who was selected by God to speak God's judgment against the Edomites. The Edomites, you'll remember, were descended from Esau, and they had always been the enemies of the descendants of Jacob. Now, I say this in the beginning, but I did last week. Please have pen and paper so you can take notes because I'll give these references. And then um, Sister Sonia West, when she puts this back on permanently on um, YouTube, you'll be able to go back and, and watch it again if you need to pick up some of these references. But regarding the matter of them the Edomites being enemies of, of Israel, you go back to Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 26, and into Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21, and then you'll remember last week in looking at the mission and the message of the prophet Amos that he was dealing with them in Amos chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Well, beginning in the 9th century B.C., Edom joined in with others in plundering the children of Israel. Several times, in fact. We don't know, that is, we can't be certain which one is the background for Obadiah's particular prophecy. But at no time was the bitterness of the Jews and the Edomites greater than when Edom joined forces with foreigners 
to besiege and capture Jerusalem in the days of, in the days of Jehoram, king of Judah. And that was about 853 to 841 B.C. The scripture citation for that is 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 20. 2 Kings 8 and verse 20. One thing, one thing interesting as we begin the book is that we know absolutely nothing about the prophet himself, that is Obadiah. And another interesting thing is that this is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Now, Jonah was a pre-exilic prophet of the northern kingdom. And his work was done in the days of King Jeroboam II. That was approximately 793 to 753 B.C. And the scripture record of that time is in 2 Kings chapter 14, chapter 8 and verse 20. No, I'm sorry, I believe that's chapter 14, chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. 2 Kings 14, 23 through 29. The books that we're looking at, I want to emphasize at this point, must be understood not only for what it has to say about those prophets at that time doing God's will to God's people because of their problem, but in the line of Romans chapter 15, verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, the scriptures spoken of by Paul in Romans 15, 4, the Old Testament scriptures that we're studying right now. The book bearing his name is really more of a narrative rather than a collection of oracles that God gave him for the people. You may not have noticed this in reading the book, but really Jonah's preaching is recorded in only eight words. Here's where you can find them. In Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 4. Jonah 3, 4. And notice it is a record of repentance or God will destroy you. Jonah's career is the only one of the minor prophets in which miracles play a rather large role. Jonah's prophecy was directed not just in general at Assyria, but at the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh. The Assyrian Empire preceded the Babylonian Empire, and they had always been Israel's enemy. They would eventually, in 721 B.C., destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. To say the least, when God called Jonah to do his work in the capital city of Syria, Nineveh, he was not a happy camper. He wasn't pleased with his task at all. In fact, what we're going to learn that sometimes gets missed in the study of Jonah is that he was an extremely bigoted person. We'll hold right there. Turning to the minor prophet Micah, we see that he was a man of Judah and he served as a prophet to his people for somewhere around a third of a century. Note Micah chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first verse of Micah chapter 1. One thing about Micah is that he was a contemporary with the great Messianic prophet Isaiah. And if you read many commentaries, you'll see that his book is sometimes called a miniature version of the book of Isaiah. Specifically, notice Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, compared with Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Micah 4, 1 through 3, compared with Isaiah 2, 3, and 4. 
I like Isaiah. Micah condemned the meaningless ritual of their sacrifices and their ceremonies. Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Micah 6, verses 7 and 8. This ought to cause us to recognize why Jesus would teach those who would be faithful servants of his, Christians, and the Lord's church, that we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. You can worship in spirit, right attitude, but be wrong regarding the truth. You can be right regarding the truth, but not have your heart in it. Be wrong in spirit. Acceptable worship has always been worshiping God in spirit and in truth. These folks had degenerated, these claiming to be servants of God, part of flesh of the Israel, to the point of where they just went through the motions, we might say. You'll see that, unlike Isaiah, Michael was of the common people. I don't know whether you've noticed, but Isaiah was of the aristocrats of his day. And the book divides itself into three sections. Three sections. And each one begins with, Hear ye. Each section, all three of them, into which the book divides itself, begins with, Hear ye and then ends with a promise. Micah 1, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 1. Now, I've already pointed out that last week we noticed what the general message of the three prophets we studied then was. And we noticed how that that's the general message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all men everywhere. To not be faithless, but believing. To repent and to reform their lives. Well, now, these three prophets, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah, have a unifying theme that runs throughout their works. And it is the universal sovereignty, judgment, and love of God. Now think about what the gospel has to say about that. And Paul preached one time, he preached of uh, judgment of God, sobriety, of the importance of repentance. In fact, how do you preach the gospel without preaching the sovereignty of God? That he is the great I am. As Moses was answered by God when he said, well, who is it that's sending me to Israel? And God told him, I am that I am. So the unifying theme of these three books, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah, is the universal sovereignty, judgment, and love of God. Now, when you look to Obadiah, you'll see that he prophesied judgment against Edom. And this demonstrates that the Edomites were subject to the fundamental divine law of loving one's neighbors. Now remember, Jesus said the first commandment was to love God with all you are and all you have. And he said the second one's likened to it, to love your neighbors yourself. And when the lawyer asked Jesus who was his neighbor, Jesus fundamentally said, Anybody, anywhere who's in need, and you're in a position to help. The Edomites were kin to the Israelites, but they didn't act like it. Remember, they descended from Esau, Jacob's brother. So they needed a lesson on how to be neighborly. And now they had not learned it, and the prophet Obadiah is saying, you're going to be punished or not being neighborly. I suggest to you that particular topic is just as fresh and important and needful today as it ever was. And you think of the situation that we're in in this country right now, to be a neighbor to somebody as the Lord defined neighbor, and as the Bible talks about Christianity and being ready unto every good work as the Bible defines good works, and doing good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, then certainly it lets us know how to be neighborly. 
when you look to Jonah, you find that this shows the breadth and the depth of divine love. Notice that it is contrasted with a very narrow human sentiment as pictured by the bigoted Jonah. It seems to me that once Jonah got to Nineveh, that he really hoped the people would believe what he preached. He hoped they wouldn't repent, that they wouldn't be spared. And that very thing happened, that is, they did repent at his preaching. How did he act? Well, if you look at Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Jonah 4, 1 through 11, you see he just, we might say, swelled up and pouted because they did repent of their sins. He had no real love for their souls. Yet he was one who was of Israel, a descendant of Jacob. So here's a preacher who hoped to fail, not in necessarily at his task, though he tried, as you know, to escape doing what God charged him to do. And then when he finally did, he hoped the people wouldn't listen and obey. When we look at Micah, he not only preached repentance to the people of Judah, but in that book, you see that he looked forward to the day of the coming of the Messiah's universal kingdom, the Lord's church. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now remember, he's contemporary with Isaiah, an aristocratic man. And yet here is a common man, Micah. I think that too goes to show that God made sure that the preacher would fit to the people to whom he had called him to preach. The reign of Christ would offer salvation to all nations alike. Now, note that the peace and the prosperity that was promised here would be fulfilled in the spiritual life of the kingdom of God. It would not be fulfilled in affairs of civil governments or civil states. There are important matters to be considered along that line as we live in the kind of nation we live in, in a republic, in what we call a nation that is free. Because even though we have all these good things that so many millions of people in the past never had as to the freedoms to worship God as we desire as our conscience dictates, and of course for us, as the New Testament teaches, we must realize that you can be a Christian anywhere. Now, it may cost you a lot to be a Christian in some parts of the world, and it has cost people much torment, persecution, even their death over the centuries to be faithful to God. But be that as it may, our hope does not lie in any fleshly nation, but our hope lies in Jesus Christ, his gospel, and being faithful citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, with those comments made about the books, let's back up and look at what we would call the major themes or pos possibly the issues. This is the approach we're taking to all these minor prophets, the major themes or issues of these books. I've already mentioned this one, and it needs to be preached on all the time, and that is turning away from a neighbor in need. Obadiah predicted doom for Edom, because you'll remember in your study of the Old Testament that it joined in the attack on Judah, blocked the way of refugees, and then was very proud and haughty over the calamity of Judah, Edom's neighbor, Obadiah chapters 13 and 14. There's no place you can turn, no place you can turn in the Old Testament or New Testament that you can find where rejoicing over another's misfortune is a good thing. 
It's always sinful. Proverbs 17 and verse 5. You can see the same thing when you study Job and all the calamity that came on him in Job 31 verse 29. Job 31 29. And then, of course, Jesus, hundreds of years later in his ministry, gave us the parable of the Good Samaritan. And when he gets through describing that, it's a very ugly thing to refuse to aid someone who's in trouble. Luke 10, 25 through 37. Now, especially when you're supposed to be God's people and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what about our age? The spirit of our age encourages people not to be humble and meek and lowly and selfless and striving to look to help others, but it encourages people to be selfish, self-willed, and really cowardly. And we can say disinterested in others. And people excuse themselves by explaining that, well, I just don't want to get involved anyway. I found it interesting that a person who thinks of himself as a Christian said one time, when asked why he didn't associate with Christians, that he said, well, I just don't have anything in common with them. I don't think that person even understood really what he confessed about his own state of mind when he said that. You don't just have to go into places like Houston or New York or Chicago. You can go in a lot of places in this land and find that People don't care to help. If someone's in trouble, they just lock the door, pull the window down. They shut their hearts against the lost in the sense of lost in trouble. But if we don't watch out, Christians, those who are of Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, can forget the lost in sin and refuse to teach the gospel to those who need it the most. They have forgotten that the church, the spiritual body of Christ, is commissioned to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. So I think it's obvious that the sin of Edom was not unique in Obadiah's time. Now, question as we leave him. Why should Nineveh give any attention at all to a Jewish prophet? Yet God chose this man, Jonah, to send to the enemies of Israel a message of salvation through a Jewish prophet. Well, there must be something here that can help me be a better servant of God today in the church. The book of Jonah displays heaven's willingness to save people other than the Jews. During the time the law of Moses was the way Israel approached God. And it shows that he's willing to save others even in the time of Christ. Look at the ministry of Christ. And ask yourself the question, why did Jesus go through Samaria when the Jews routinely would not do so at all? This does not fit the traditional representation of the father rule period, the patriarchal age. We don't think of it in that way because we're so interested in looking at the Bible from the as the unfolding of the scheme of redemption. And so you have the patriarchal age of the father rule period where God uh, or the fathers approached God as the priest and prophet, led the family in worship. And we don't realize that it ended only for the Jews, but it continued on for the Gentiles even if the majority of them desire not to retain God in their knowledge and are like those we read of in Romans chapter 1. 
It is very interesting to know that when you read Cornelius, who was not a proselyte, was an uncircumcised Gentile, that he was one who believed in God, but he was not a proselyte. Yet his prayer had come up his mind before God, and he was told to send to Joppa for one Peter who could come and tell him words whereby he could be saved. Because the way he had been approaching God was over and done with, just like the Jews under the law was over and done with once the church was established. And so even at the time the law of Moses was the way the Jews approached God, here this Jew approaching God under the law of Moses is selected by God to go to these pagans and to preach the truth to them. Why? Because God loved them. He loved the non-Israelites. So Jonah could preach repentance rather than conversion to Judaism in Nineveh. They could repent under the patriarchy and serve God, as he had to serve God under the law of Moses. Another question remains, how likely is it that so great and proud, haughty a city as Nineveh would repent when they heard the message of Nineveh? Most people would say, well, those people wouldn't listen to anything like that. Jonah hoped they wouldn't. But Jonah preached repentance because God told him to. And after trying to run away from God, which he should have had enough gumption and sense to know he couldn't do that, swallowed by the great fish, worked out on the shore and at least agreed to go do what God first told him to do. He still didn't like it because the people heard the message, believed it, and obeyed it. So how likely would it be that this haughty city of Nineveh would do so? Well, if you look a little bit at the history of the time, you'll see that this great and mighty Assyria was experiencing all sorts of civil unrest, all kinds of revolts in several of her provinces. Things can be at certain times an ideal situation for the gospel to be preached, when at other times it might not be. Now, we're to preach it at all times to all people, but sometimes it impacts people differently from at other times. I don't know how many people have prayed that people in this nation and the world would turn back to being more interested in spiritual matters. Now, think about that when you consider the situation we're in today with this virus business. The mood of the people at this time in Assyria was one of unrest, was one of depression, was one of uncertainty. And these things can certainly contribute to the readiness, not only of the Ninevites, but people today to give the proper attention to what they used to just wink at. Now, is the church today prepared to preach to Nineveh, as it were? The harvest actually was ripe in the city of Nineveh, and God chose Jonah to reap it. We should be wise enough to realize, listen to me, that in times, certain times, in the life, of an individual or a whole society. Such things develop to make things ready and to give us a harvest that's ripe at the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Consider with me the profession and the performance. Look to Micah again. Like the other faithful prophets, he emphasized that a believer's performance, his actions, his conduct, must match, must be in concert with, rather than contradict what he professes. Jesus asked this question, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? James dealt with that among Christians in James 2 when he talked about the difference in a dead faith and a living faith. 
A dead faith will acknowledge God exists. Christ is the Son of God. The Bible is the Word of God. I ought to do what He says, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do what He said and the way He said it and for the reason He said it. The people of this time were performing their religious ceremonies at specific times. They may not have missed any kind of religious service. But they were ignoring the fact that their religion committed them to a life of constant righteousness all day long, every day, under any circumstance and situation. I want to emphasize, you can go back and read it, but read Micah 6 and verse 8, especially the latter part of verse 8, Micah 6 verse 8, regarding what the Lord expects us to do concerning his covenant, not only professing it with the mouth, but practicing it in our lives. Of course, this doesn't mean that a virtuous life is, accept, is an acceptable substitute for right doctrine and true worship. It simply means that right doctrine and true worship without, I say without, a virtuous life is empty, it's vain, it's worthless. The New Testament emphasizes over and over the same thing. Luke 6, verse 46, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. Now we'll move toward the end and look at Obadiah, John, and Micah again. It's sort of an overview of each book. Here's where you might want to be particular about your notes, but maybe go back and if you miss some and watch the latter part of the lesson at least, make sure you have the right scripture references. First of all, the book of Obadiah. The opening verses of this brief prophecy focuses us on the terrible sin of Edom, verses 1 through 14. But then it moves us to the very severe judgment that was coming against the nation because of her sins, verses 15 and 16. Then the last few verses point to future exaltation for those who flee to Mount Zion, verses 17 through 21. Of course, this is a prediction of the church to come. Moving for Obadiah, we look again at Jonah. And we all realize that when God called him to go to Nineveh, as I said earlier, he fled, he ran away or attempted to, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Then a tremendous storm came against the ship that he had boarded. And this caused him to confess his sin, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. And the sailors, at his request, actually cast him overboard. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 16. And, of course, there's great fish prepared by God to swallow Jonah. Chapter 1, verse 17. And we do see that he repents over his actions. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And Jonah is delivered by the Lord, chapter 2, verse 10. But notice, God renews his commission for Jonah to go to Assyria to Nineveh and preach repentance, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This time, the prophet Jonah obeyed, chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. And much, I guess we could say, to the consternation and surprise of Jonah, the city of Nineveh repented at his preaching. Jonah 3, verses 5 through 9. And it was spared, chapter 3, verse 10. But I noticed Jonah's reaction was one of anger, and uh, he was highly displeased, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So you have the lesson of the gourd vine 
as a rebuke to his wicked state of mind about those people who needed to repent, and they did. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. I really don't understand how the Jews during Jesus' day could read and understand the book of Jonah, especially about the prophet's attitude toward Assyria, not see themselves. But they didn't. And this tells us why it was that so many things of the Old Testament that pointed to the Messiah and his kingdom and the attitude that ought to exist among those that serve God, even in the Old Testament, just wasn't there among those people. They missed it. And we shouldn't do that today, too. But we can if they did. So we must be careful. And then there's the book of Micah, the last one for the night. Micah, you remember, announced punishment from God against Israel, chapter 1, and verses 1 through 7, as well as the southern kingdom of Judah, chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. He then gives the reasons for this judgment, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, chapter 2, 1 through 11, and the restoration Watch it, of the remnant, not everybody, but of a remnant is promised. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. After describing their, at that time, present sorry and pitiful state of affairs, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, Micah speaks of the future glory to be revealed in Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 5, and verse 15. The book closes with a plea for repentance. God's complaint against the people, chapter 6, verses 1 through 16, leads the great prophet Micah to lament the lack of righteousness in Jerusalem. That's found in chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 and to confess their sin, chapter 7, 7 through 17, and to rejoice in the mercies of the Lord, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. There's a lot more in all three of these books, as there were in the books of last week, that could be drawn out and emphasized for us as Christians today in the Lord's church. But you will notice how these three books anticipate the universal scope and appeal of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they remind us that God's love embraces all humanity and desires the salvation of everyone. Thus, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think of just how that applied to these prophets working in their day, not only to Israel, but to people like the Ninevites in Assyria. Now, if time allows and this whole coronavirus thing continues to go as it's going, and who knows where it's going to lead, lead except God, We'll look next week on Wednesday night at Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And we hope these brief studies that are designed to hopefully whet your appetite to a deeper study of these minor prophets will help you in appreciating more of what we're to be in the church of the living God as brothers and sisters in Christ and that we'll remember each other in prayer in these difficult times, that we will be ready unto every good work, that we will be sacrificial in what we're willing to do, because that's our reasonable service, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. But that reasonable service doesn't come except that we renew our minds with the truth of God's good word and live it out in our lives. So I hope you have a good night. Lord willing, we will bring you a lesson again on Sunday. And take care, be safe, remain healthy. Let's all keep one another in our prayers. Thank you.